my, my presentation is going to be just about the war without the cuteness part. Um, <laughs> And specifically, I'm going to talk about how the international society is responding to mass atrocity crises in the 21st century. And for tonight, I want to talk to you about the humanitarian crisis, which is ongoing in the Central African Republic. And I am to specifically look at how we assess the success of these uh, uh, humanitarian operations in, uh, in the Central African Republic. But to really understand what the responsibility to protect is about, I would like to take you back to 1994. And um, this is the time, this is the year when the genocide in Rwanda took place, when um, despite the fact that 800,000 Tutsi and moderate Hutu were killed by extremist Hutus, the international society, society stood by. Not only did it stood, uh, stand by, but it actually deliberately um, avoid using the word genocide because that would have created an obligation um, to prevent genocide and to react on the basis of the 1948 Genocide Convention. Five years later, we have another situation when the international society intervened in Kosovo um, to, pro to, to stop the ethnic cleansing, but their operation, NATO's operations, uh, were deemed legitimate but illegal. And that was because it bypassed the UN um, Security Council, which is the only body in inter international society which um, can uh, approve military, coercive military interventions. So it was against the, this background that um, the United Nations Security General at that time, um, Secretary General Kofi Annan, called for a reconciliation between state sovereignty and human rights. And we're not talking about any kind of human rights, but really basic human rights. Um, and um, his, uh, the response to his, uh, his call came in 2001, when the International Commission on Intervention and State Sovereignty issued its report on the responsibility to protect. And four years later, it was adopted by the United Nations General Assembly um, at the World Summit. So it was only in 2005 when world governments has, have created this consensus that states have a responsibility to protect their populations from gross uh, human rights violations. It's important to notice that it's the United Nations General Assembly who, um, who has made the, uh, this agreement. So it's a political agreement, not a legally binding agreement. The only body that issues legally binding um, resolutions is the UN, UN Security Council. However, this is important because it has created the base for a normative development of how we approach humanitarian crises. So what is really the responsibility to protect? So in 2005, world governments have um, agreed and have come to this consensus that they have the responsibility to protect their populations for four, cri four crimes. Ethnic cleansing, genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. It was nothing new, really. These, are all, or these were already uh, regulated through um, uh, United Nations conventions, such as the Genocide Convention or the Refugee uh, Geneva Conventions. In 2009, the UN uh, Secretary General has released his first report on the responsibility to protect. And he really offered us a way of structuring this responsibility to protect. He uh, organized it into three pillars. The first pillar was about state responsibility to protect their populations. Populations, not just citizens. The second pillar was about the international society responsibility to assist um, states that are willing but unable to protect their populations. So it's about supportive, um, um, supportive assistance. Um, and this comes in different ways, such as encouragement, encouragement, capacity building, or military interventions with the consent of the state. In cases where um, states are unwilling and unable to protect their populations, then the international society has the responsibility to take collective action in a timely and decisive manner. And this, uh, this comes in forms such as economic sanctions or uh, military interventions like we have seen in, uh, in Libya. What I'm trying to argue is that 
actually the bigger aim of the responsibility to protect is to reconceptualize sovereignty. So to move away from negative conceptions of sovereignty as non-intervention and non-interference in, um, in uh, national political affairs, um, but to emphasize the positive aspect of sovereignty. So the government taking action to ensure that the, uh, its population is protected from these four crimes. So really the, the goal is to create responsible sovereigns, sovereigns that are both willing and able to protect their populations. Now moving on to the Central African Republic. Since 2013, um, Central African Republic, which is also known as the forgotten country, um, has joined the graveyard of the never again stories. Um, despite the fact that since its independence, its history has been a very violent one and all government transitions um, have, been, uh, um, have occurred through coup d'etat, um, this has taken somehow the international society by surprise. So what was happening? In early 2013, uh, Muslim Seleka rebels overthrew the president. Seleka is a coalition of different uh, fractions uh, of rebels. So this led uh, the Christian anti-Balaka militias, anti-Balaka means anti-Machets, because that's how the Seleka were fighting, um, responded to the abuses of Seleka by, atta by attacking the Muslim uh, minority. So in a matter of months, the conflict amounted to ethnic cleansing and genocide. So these are two words that I'm not taking easily, because ethnic cleansing is the deliberate Dispossession, removal of a population based on their nationality, ethnicity, uh, religion, or race from a specific territory. So they want to purify a particular part of the territory. And genocide means that, again, you deliberately try to destroy in part or in whole a category of people based on uh, their religion, nationality, race, or ethnicity, not political affiliation. Um, so at this time, the Central African Republic government asked for international assistance to protect this population. So this makes the case of the Central African Republic um, that, uh, to fall under pillar two operations. So it's international assistance, but it's supportive, although it is military intervention, but not only. So how do we, ass uh, do we um, assess uh, the success of the R2P implementation in the Central African Republic crisis? Well, there isn't really a straightforward answer to this. Uh, so based on literature on peace building, I've been trying to um, differentiate between different interpretations of, of success for, uh, for R2P. Um, in minimalist terms, um, R2P would be a success if um, we notice a decrease in, violence, in levels of violence and then eventually the halt of the crisis. Uh, a moderate interpretation of success would also mean capacity building. So this is really um, contingent upon a specific view of what protection and peace means. Uh, it's viewed as order, but not, not any kind of order, order uh, through a liberal institutional governance. So it's about building good governance. In maximalist terms, you'd also address the root causes of the conflict. And this touches upon Galtung's conception of uh, positive peace. So that is not just the absence of direct violence, but also of uh, indirect violence. So you want to look at the, structure, uh, of the structures that uh, perpetuate um, economic inequality, for example, or diminish um, social and cultural rights. But again, if you are to think about what is the aim of the responsibility to protect, which for me is creating responsible sovereigns, then to really break the cycle of violence, you'd look for at least a moderate interpretation of success, ideally a maximalist one. So when looking at the responsibility to protect implementation in the Central African Republic, um, my first question was, about whether the responses that the international society has taken were proportional with the ends. Uh, and by ends, I mean at least a moderate interpretation of success. 
So you stop the crisis and then you try to address institutional, uh, institutional uh, capacity building. And uh, the straightforward uh, answer to that um, for me comes in three, um, in, three, in three layers. First, the response was not proportional. And first of all, because the international society failed to prevent the crisis. Um, and here we talk about a simply about lack of political willingness to respond to early, war early warnings. So it was not a matter of not knowing what was happening international, uh, in uh, the Central African Republic. Actually, the UN uh, Peace Building Office was on the ground since 2010 because, as I said, violence um, uh, was before 2013. It was just then when it... Uh, developed along uh, ethnic uh, lines. Um, the Human Rights Council issued numerous um, statements and reports uh, before the crisis reached its peaks, uh, and the UN Joint Office on the Responsibility to Protect and the Prevention of Genocide again issued four alarming statements at that time, calling the United Nations Security Council to, um, uh, to take adequate measures. So in the words of UN Secretary General, we have not made the difference that we promised we would make to prevent the preventable. So what we see is a story that we hear again and again, knowledge of a crisis that not represent a trigger for instant response. It's a matter of political will, uh, which is really the biggest challenge for R2P implementation in humanitarian crises. Whether it was easy to make um, the Central African Republic a uh, priority at that time, I will leave it maybe to the Q&A um, session. So there was a lack of uh, a failure to uh, respond to um, early warnings. Then another uh, failure came through operational challenges. So when the international society did respond, its response did not match the gravity and the scale of the crisis. Um, and we see that France and the, economy, uh, the economic uh, community of Central African states had troops on the ground at the time when the, uh, when the conflict was developing. And then we see a number of regional and international peacekeeping and stabilization operations uh, that start to, um, 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 to send their troops on the ground. However, there were massive delays in transition between these international missions. Um, and um, it took longer than expected and then planned for EU uh, troops, uh, bridging operations, and UN-led uh, uh, operation MINUSCA to reach its full, uh, its full uh, capacity. And even the fact that it took the UN to send its own UN-led uh, um, troops on the ground says something, um, because before that it relied on uh, French troops and on sub-regional and regional um, troops presence there. And despite the tra uh, delays in transition, there was lack of resource and funding. So what we see here is that although there were more than 12,000 peacekeeping troops on the, tra on, on the ground, and that were coming just from, the, from MINUSCA, from the UN-led operation, this doesn't really say um, anything about their capacity to implement the mandate that they were given. And that was because of lack of resources and funding, which ultimately led to having uh, ill-prepared peacekeepers that were not able to fulfill their mandate. If you were to, su to assess the responsibility to protect success in, term in terms of the number of missions on the ground at this time, which is a number of seven, then we would say that, yes, there would be a success. But again, numbers don't, uh, don't say much about uh, their capacity. If you were to assess the responsibility to protect uh, success to the number of UN Security Council resolutions, which at that time were more than 10, seven specifically, specifically uh, using the responsibility to protect uh, language, we say that, yes, R2P in the Central African Republic is on the top of the international agenda. But then again, we've seen the responses. And besides all that, the insufficient capacity and funding, which is it's something that we see in many um, op regional and international um, operations, and not that in Central African Republic, says a lot about the, cap the gap that exists between how 
we see this normative commitment and what we expect from the responsibility to protect and actually the reality on the, of the ground and the material capabilities and the capacity that it has. So in the words of uh, Alex Bellamy, who is one of the uh, most prominent scholars on R2P, R2P is not a self-executing bullet, silver bullet and enforcement is everybody's business. And that means sub-regional, regional and international um, organizations. And there's this quote that I was reading in an uh, Afri uh, Amnesty International report last year from one of the generals that was leading um, 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 some troops from, uh, from the UN, from MINUSCA, who was saying that no one has the capacity to replace a country. So again, um, a call for managing expectations. So where are we now? Um, four years after the, um, the crisis began. There was a ceasefire agreement in 2015, which still holds now. Violence has been reduced considerably, but every week you hear about uh, violence, violent uh, um, outbreaks. Last week, um, because of a fight between um, Exeleka uh, fractions, nine people died and 9,000 were displaced. Um, MINUSCA's mandate uh, was uh, renewed at the beginning of these years until, next, until 2017. But this capacity is repeatedly tested. Um, and it actually proves to be not very efficient in making these violent uh, outbreaks, um, preventing them from, uh, from happening. The French troops have, uh, have, left, uh, have left the stage, the Sangaris um, operation. Um, and France said that it has achieved its, uh, its goal successfully, despite the fact that at the moment that I'm speaking, 400,000 people are internally displaced and 500,000 people are refugees. This is one-fifth of a country's population. And 80% uh, of these people are, are Muslims. So... Ethnic cleansing is clearly ongoing there. Uh, there's a problem with UN's peacekeeping sexual abuse, and Central African Republic is one of the uh, places where this is uh, becoming endemic. Over 2,000 uh, 2, uh, cases of sexual abuse perpetrated by the UN peacekeeping um, troops. The presidential elections uh, at the beginning of last year were successful, so that capacity building strategy has start to, started to... Um, uh, to take an effect. Uh, we've seen diplomatic measures led by sub-regional and regional organizations, and that's, that's a good thing to see that uh, this res responsibility, responsibility is somehow um, shared between uh, organizations. There was an uh, international commission of inquiry established in the Central African Republic, and that is meaningful for uh, reconciliation and addressing the accountability gap. Uh, UN sanctions regime is still in place, um, including an arms embargo. The International Criminal Court has started an investigation in 2014 and um, the government has also decided on establishing a special criminal court uh, that would have its jurisdiction starting from 2003, but it's heavily underfunded. Internally displaced people camps uh, are uh, beginning to, to close which is really a test for reconciliation because people are not ready to go back to their communities and, um, and live next to one another uh, before, uh, before justice is, uh, is addressed. And the demobilization, disarmament and uh, reintegration program has started um, to, um, to, start to, to take place, but mainly led by uh, the UN operation and not by the government. As uh, Sin Mar was saying, one of the follow uh, closely followers of the conflict, if we are serious about preventing uh, Central African Republic from going to another um, uh, violent, big, vi very violent episode, uh, we have to engage with the international society has to engage with the authorities and people of the Central African Republic to develop institutional resilience to mass atrocity crimes. So again, we see this moderate interpretation of. 
uh, the responsibility to protect and paying attention to local ownership. So what, what do the people um, in the Central African Republic want? However, um, if we look closely, we see that most of the efforts in the Central African Republic have been directed at strengthening the capacity of the missions there and not the capacity of the state. So I think that says a lot about how uh, the international society is, is tackling this, the capacity that it has to tackle this, uh, these problems. So to conclude, um, despite the fact that the crisis uh, has begun with a, tra a tragic failure and um, the failure to, um, to prevent its escalation. Um, R2P implementation in the Central African Republic is still being written. The response was not pro of the international society was not proportional with, uh, with its goals of halting the crisis and creating good governance. Um, and addressing the root cause is still uh, a very, uh, very far away. Um, and this, this says a lot about um, the proportionality that the international society um, had in re its response to addressing the humanitarian crisis there, because the R2P objectives are bigger than humanitarian intervention. It's more than just about halting the crisis. It's about creating responsible sovereigns. So there you're looking at rebuilding the state. So in short, uh, the success in the uh, of the responsibility to protect in the Central African Republic, I would say it, it is maybe a moderate success, a mixture of failure and success. But it has been successful in decreasing the levels of violence and has started addressing um, capacity building. Thank you. So in this specific case, I think the responsibility to protect has been somehow successful in advancing this protection discourse that in Rwanda we have not seen. So it somehow increased the political cost of inaction. Uh, and we're talking about major powers not necessarily having big interest in the Central African Republic. So from this perspective, I think that it actually it has an added, added value. Respect to Iraq and uh, Afghanistan, um, they wouldn't fall under responsibility to protect Afghanistan because it was a war of self-defense, uh, and Iraq, uh, firstly, because it wouldn't meet the uh, for mass atrocity uh, crimes threshold, and then Iraq, <laughs> the intervention in Iraq bypassed the UN Security Council again. Um, the responsibility to protect only, uh, only uh, works through the United Nations um, Security Council. As with regards to intervention more generally undermining uh, local capacities uh, or doing more uh, bad things than, uh, than good ones, um, I would say that that's a fair criticism if you look uh, at the case in Libya, which was a responsibility to protect case. It was a, th a third pillar case. So the intervention there was coercive. Uh, it, um, it, uh, and it kind of exceeded, not kind of, it exceeded its mandate. It went beyond protection of civilians and it led to regime change, which is not something the responsibility to protect uh, um, uh, comprises. Um, and in the case of Libya, that's also interesting because the international society has intervened and has left. There was no rebuilding done there. Actually, it's very interesting because from all the, all the cases, this is the first one that UN, that, that UN, the US 
has had absolutely no presence on the ground. No troops, no military troops, no advisors, not, uh, not anything. But rebuilding, rebuilding is not, uh, was left out of the 2001 report. Rebuilding was not part of the um, commitment that the UN General Assembly has, uh, has made. Yes. So here's where I stretch a little bit where responsibility to protect is. Uh, that's why I think it's important to frame responsibility to protect as having its aim to create responsible sovereigns, because that would somehow create at least a moral responsibility from the part of international society to rebuild states or try to, um, to develop that um, mechanisms to break the cycles of violence. Um, Reading the UN Secretary General reports on the responsibility to protect, which come out every year, so it's quite a big, quite a big thing, um, you wouldn't really see peace, uh, positive peace aspects in them. They are mentioned, but they are mentioned as this is a very long-term strategy. We are more interested in addressing um, negative peace, of just making sure that the crisis um, has stopped. Um, so... Um, for this kind of, of thing that you're talking about, you have the UN uh, Peace Building Office that is addressing, uh, on a longer term, uh, addressing, um, addressing root causes. What I'm trying to argue is that if you want to have responsible sovereigns that are both willing and able to protect their population, so not just what the Central African Republic is, it is willing but it's not able to, to fulfill its responsibility, um, then you want responsibility to protect to include this... Uh, uh, these kind of measures. In a case like this, is there any colonial tension that still remains? The idea of a country like France having troops on the ground in the, in the former colony? Yes, yes. And uh, France was actually w the only country that was advocating in the UN Security Council to. Um, for the UN Security Council to take over the mission from the African Union, which is a regional organization in Africa, and send a UN full, uh, full mission. Um, so it was France advocacy to increase that operations. African Union had five to 6,000 troops on the ground, uh, whereas uh, the UN-led operation has over uh, 12,000. Um, and that was clearly because of France, uh, uh, France, France uh, neo-colonial interests in, uh, in the Central African Republic, yes. So again, it's a matter of political will, and that cramps from the different interests that, especially the permanent five members, so that's US, China, France, UK, and, the US, uh, and uh, Russia have in, uh, in this kind of uh, conflicts, I mean, settings. Okay, so in short, I think that's a very slippery slope, and that touches upon sensitive issues like self-determination and um, sovereignty as non-interference in political affairs. Uh, and that's one of the cases where Ru Russia and China, for example, is 
vetoing every time every resolution that we see with respect to Syria because they have they have they know that what happened in uh, in Libya might happen to uh, to Assad um, so yes in Libya they have e legally exceeded their their mandate and I understand I understand this this argument that okay you're stopping the crisis but is there protection on the longer term for the populations if you, li if you leave the same person, the same system in place? Uh, and for that, I think it's important to work with the people and give a sense of local um, ownership. So it's still, um, it's still a decision for the Libyan people to, um, to take, yeah, and the international society to, to support them in that. Mm, yes? Well, ah, from uh, intervention in Ukraine. Um, it was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, the, I was at a conference two years ago, and the, um, a member of the foreign, uh, foreign affairs ministry in Russia was trying to make the case that actually Russia has annexed Crimea, and what it's doing in eastern Ukraine is a matter of responsibility to protect because the Ukrainians are committing genocide against, uh, against Russian-speaking uh, population. Uh, so you see how they are trying to manipulate um, what, uh, what the responsibility to protect is about. It wouldn't fall under responsibility to protect because it wouldn't mean, that it wouldn't mean uh, the threshold. It's not genocide, it's not ethnic cleansing. Uh, war, crimes, war crimes might be, but uh, this is very interesting because in the UN Security Council in the permanent five members, one of the permanent five members is Russia. Russia is never going to, uh, to approve a resolution that would uh, allow for military intervention. Yeah. So R2P in this case fails to come with a solution to one of the main problems that was created to address as we've seen in Kosovo. Yes, where, the, where NATO bypassed the UN Security Council, especially because it knew that Russia would, would veto the intervention in Kosovo. And yet it has done nothing to address how decision making is, uh, is made in the uh, UN Sec uh, Security Council. However, it has sparked interest in different um, initiatives like Restrain the Veto, which is led by France and, uh, and Britain. Um, and they're trying to create this sort of norm that uh, vetoing um, international society reaction uh, in <coughs> cases of mass atrocity crisis. It's, uh, it's not a thing that should, uh, should be done. Okay, so in the case of Libya, um, Gaddafi had clearly made declarations that they're go he's going to um, crush the, he called them some sort of bugs or something, yes, exactly, um, the protesters. Uh, and that is uh, one of the things that fall under, um, uh, under the process of you know, committing gross human rights uh, violations. So in that case, Responsibility to protect was more of a preventative, uh, preventative measure. Whereas in the case of Saddam, um, the um, motivation of uh, the U.S. In, in Britain intervening there was because they had weapons of mass destruction. It was not a, ma a matter of uh, human rights violations. Only after they were trying to uh, change the discourse so that they gain more legitimacy for what they were doing um, and um, frame it in terms of uh, minority uh, minority populations being uh, oppressed in, um, in, 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 in Iraq. In Iraq. Oh, um, and what about Assad? What about so in, a, uh, in the case of Syria, you have war and crimes and crimes against humanity. There are reports on that. There are UN um, um, office on the prevention of genocide and responsibility to protect that um, uh, make this uh, very clear. Um, so it, it would be a, a case for responsibility to protect, but again, this is a matter of political will. China and Russia are vetoing every resolution that, um, 
that is trying to, um, to pass military intervention or any other form of coercive intervention to stop Assad. Um, and there are even, there are also um, vetoing resolutions that would send uh, Assad, uh, that would start an investigation for the International Criminal Court because Assad is a, a war criminal. So it's, it's a matter of political will again, yes. Thank you again. Thanks. Thanks.